This meeting is being recorded. All right then, so let's begin our session. Happy Friday, everyone. And again, we are very excited to be here with all of you. And we have this session, which will be in Spanish, and we'll speak about a lot of the data for those people who need interpretation. Let's uh, give some announcements first. But first of all, I want to welcome all of you. We are here, again, advancing equity and ending sexual violence. And this is our national conference. Uh, NSAC 2021. My name is Sandy Monroy and I work uh, with Valor. And for me, it's an honor. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And we will be giving you information in just a second. Ashley, go ahead. I can't hear Ashley. Uh, but just so you know, she's giving the um, instructions as to how to join. Thank you, Ashley. Accessibility in uh, the uh, videos for the ASL interpreters will be spotlighted uh, next uh, to the speakers' uh, videos in all of our NSAC sessions. Whenever we share a screen with, uh, if you can't see the slides, uh, please utilize uh, the uh, button at the um, the button at the bottom of the screen. And you can also go to the top of the screen and you can uh, choose side to side view or uh, go and bring, bring the cursor over the, uh, over the top of, uh, of the slides um, or the video and click on that button so that you are able to see that particular screen. How to use a Zoom. Uh, we have at the bottom the chat box. You can send a chat uh, to any one of us at the Valor team. We are here to help you. And you can also ask questions uh, directly to the presenters. So again, the slides, the PowerPoint slides will be available in our um, website. For many of you who already have your link, perhaps you already have a, a access to those PowerPoint slides. And for those people who just joined us, this will be available on our website soon. Again, so some of our, our poll questions, we have only one question that we'll have for the audience. We hope that you answer every, uh, the, that question, but we'll also be posing questions in the chat via phone. You can also join us via phone. You can call on your phone so you can hear us. And again, so we also have subtitles in English available. We also want to invite you to share with all of us. We know that you have access to the platform to be to be able to see all the agencies that are uh, having some um, expositions that uh, information for the, those agencies who are working not just here in this state, but throughout the entire country. So I want to, for you to take a moment to come and visit this uh, this. Um, expositions, uh, these vendors, and um, also that you can share your information with them. So again, uh, community guidelines. This is quite important for you to uh, keep in mind. We want to remind you that we all come from uh, different backgrounds and we are uh, in, we're, we're uh, approaching this from different perspectives. We all have different life perspectives, which is the reason why we ask you to be mindful of the following. Let's be mindful. Let's be conscientious as to how we can participate. Let's be patient. Uh, we uh, continue, I ask that we continue being flexible and patient. Um, in any case that we have any kind of technological challenge. 
let's be present and let's uh, give ourselves the opportunity to listen to the leaders of this movement who are carrying out very important work in each one of these uh, communities and they are having such a uh, wonderful impact and we are valor let's um have a, in order to have those conversations those real conversations about this a very important work very sensible work it, it requires for us to have such a valor so i want to remind every single one of you that these community guidelines are quite important for each one of us and we want for you to be able to share today so let's follow these community guidelines for today's meeting And so now we're getting to our presentation for today. And this is um, community outreach responses to help elevate the dignity of the survivors um, of sexual assault through healing and support in marginalized communities. The presenters we have for you today will be fo uh, focused on two very different areas, each one of them, but each one of those areas is quite important to get to the point where we can help heal those people who have suffered sexual assault, uh, rape, uh, domestic violence, and all these traumatic um, issues. And these two speakers are uh, having and doing such an effort, such important work to help their communities and at the same time to become that bridge, not only for the survivors, but also to, for the work that Valor is doing, not only to, in, through our state, but also throughout the entire country. So it's a pleasure that you are all joining us and it's a, um, I'm glad and I hope that you all can learn so much and I'll talk to you a little bit about the presenters that you have for you today. Our first presenter, it's uh, Reverend Benjamin Ortega. He is the main pastor and president of Ministerio Fuente de Vida in Glendale, California. And during the last 15 years, he has implemented um, the various counseling programs and uh, support in the Latino community, uh, advocating for the respect uh, for the dignity of each person and empowering the new generations against uh, violence. Uh, uh, verbal abuse, uh, physical abuse, and emotional abuse. The Pastor Ortega works um, with more than 50 religious or faith-based leaders who have established growth programs and family development programs throughout the entire state and throughout the country. Pastor Ortega has his master's degree in divinity with an emphasis in pastoral care and familiar care at the uh, Seminario Teológico Forward. Um, currently, he is a candidate to a PhD in theology and family ministries. Um, we want to welcome Pastor Benjamin Ortega, who will be speaking to us uh, later on throughout this session. And he'll talk to us about all the work he's been able to do in his community. And he's also uh, truly demonstrating to be a, a faith-based uh, leader in with uh, carrying out a service and work to help and support those uh, survivors of sexual assault. And our first speaker, our first panelist today is Ms. Margaret Sousa. Many of you in California do know her. Margaret Sousa has been with, uh, she has joined us with the uh, agency Sure Hotline. She is uh, the executive director for Sure Hotline. And she has worked in the, uh, different uh, points with immigration, with other entities that apply the law or law-based entities. She's worked with uh, the different district attorneys, uh, with the Mexican consulate, as well as other organizations in her tireless work to end sexual violence in our communities. Ms. Sousa and her team have carried out trainings throughout the entire state of California. She has worked uh, closely with ICE and she has also um, had done a lot of training for the uh, community um, and with the LGBTQ community and focus on a, a lot of these uh, emotional issues in, in, to prevent suicide. She is um, one of uh, our vice presidents at Valor US, uh, formerly Calcasa. She's also a for, uh, member of Alianza Latina for to end uh, domestic violence. And she has uh, so many accomplishments. She's also a, a 
recipient of 2018 um, recognition by the very famous uh, rock and roll, uh, Spanish rock and roll band, Mana. She has also received a uh, woman of the year recognition in 2015. Also a, and also a recipient of a recognition from a non-profit organization. Um, in her area. So for me, it's a true pleasure to have the privilege, one, to be able to work with both of these uh, speakers, uh, bo uh, Pastor, as well as Margaret, but also it's a pleasure to see their work and to witness the transformation that they are accomplishing and how they're transforming so many lives. So I would like to invite uh, Margaret first to speak to us a bit about her work, all the effort that she has uh, implemented throughout her community. Good morning. How are you? How how's everyone doing? For me, it's an honor to be here with you, and to share with you the work we are doing at our agency, Sure Helpline. As Sandy mentioned, I am the executive director for this center, and we are located right on the borderline between uh, California and Mexico, Mexicali. Uh, to be specific, uh, Calexico, California, and Mexicali, Mexico. So we have a lot of activity here for the um, simple reason that we are a border town and for having um, so many things happen, happening here um, continuously. I was born in Mexicali, which again, it's a border town. Both my parents were, my mother was from the United States, from Calexico. And my father was from East Los Angeles. So again, I was naturalized uh, from American parents and I love my work. My uh, career, I was a real estate uh, runner for many, many years, but uh, there was always in me that, that love for helping my brethren. Uh, and I always did. So when the opportunity came to work at this center, I took it. I took it and uh, gratefully so they gave it to me and I'm immensely happy because I can do so many things here to help. I have been able to open so many doors. And so I want to share with all of you what we at our agency have gone through. And at this valley, one of the things that we have seen that has been happening uh, a lot uh, lately, it's all the people that have come the people that come and um, request asylum, humanitarian based asylum. So thousands and thousands of people have started coming this way, particularly unaccompanied um, uh, children. And so it's my understanding that during the month of March, about 18,700 unaccompanied minors entered the United States alone. And the following month, um, more than 19,000 unaccompanied children. So again, there are so many children in many detention centers throughout the border with Texas, Arizona, and California. We have noticed, and we have, um, uh, we have uh, personally and firsthand seen the needs so in the uh, Imperial Valley on a particular location, not too long ago, we uh, had the need to unite, to, to be able to help with the influx of uh, recent immigrants or the recent influx of immigrants that has been uh, as of late coming more numerous. And I wanna share with you that uh, a personal anecdote, a 24 year old American young man, uh, he went and studied to, to became a border patrol agent. And one day um, I, I, he came to see me and with his um, teary eyes, uh, he told me, I can't do this job. I can't do this job. And the reason why he felt he couldn't do this job personally, he was in, uh, assigned to uh, the Yuma area because he got to see what uh, thing what has been done to thousands of immigrants. In this case, he got to see children, so many children, and these uh, touched his heart. 
he is now doing a different kind of work. But uh, I just want to share with you how strong was his impression that, uh, that um, or how strong and how emotional this is that the doctor that I personally see shared with me that the, most of uh, his patients come uh, from the um, border patrols. Um, and many people who work there have been becoming have become emotionally distraught because of the things that they face in their work. So I wanted to share with all of you that uh, we have heard so many stories of people who have crossed the border. Many firsthand stories, many firsthand accounts of what some of these immigrants have suffered. We have seen and we have spoken with young girls, um, little girls, young girls who come alone, who have been detained and who have at some point needed some sanitary feminine um, um, things and how they have not gotten those and have had to make do and have actually walked around uh, with blood in their underwear. And all of these situations become uh, very sad and in this work, you must understand, I think you all do understand that it becomes even more important to have that patience and that passion and that love for one's uh, brethren. And I think that this is one of the things that I focus most in, in, in emphasizing that we must have the desire to help and work in this area. We at Short Helpline have worked with some of the detention centers. We have worked with the prison system. We have, with some prisons, excuse me. We have worked uh, with, uh, with the Mexican consulate and with the naval base and many different places. But I just want to remind you that many of these things don't just fall from the sky. We have had to focus and, and go and see how we can obtain the access uh, to this area so that we can um, deliver our services. So uh, during the month of March, I was called uh, to a meeting. So apparently, This, uh, they expected to have a larger influx uh, than ever. And uh, people who were coming here to uh, request a humanitarian asylum. And so this was a meeting called from uh, on the Imperial Valley County. So a few people uh, came to this meeting, Sure Helpline, myself, and also the Salvation Army and other organizations came to this meeting. One of the problems that they presented as well was that they didn't have enough rooms to uh, receive all these people who were requesting humanitarian asylum. I had uh, the luck to be able to um, get in touch with um, someone that I know who uh, owns a large hotel in the outskirts of town. And I had already been sharing with him this, uh, the particulars of this situation. And he had already helped me to uh, maybe uh, house uh, some of the events that I had been carrying out. So I called him and I asked him if he still had those 100 rooms available. So it was a, a joy for me to be able to tell the state in at this uh, meeting, there were a lot of people on Zoom from Washington, joining us from Washington, from Sacramento. And when all, well, I was very grateful that I was able to tell them that I had these rooms available. And that when, where our movement, uh, this work to be able to share these resources and help out with these resources began. And it was our county that opened up the doors in uh, upon scene and that my team was ready to go. And again, I'm very proud to say to you that after that meeting, uh, 48 hours after that meeting, we were called and we were told, yes, uh, the, the buses with the immigrants, the asylum seekers are coming in. So the county had, uh, uh, you had been using a gymnasium in a local university for those people who, again, uh, these people who were um, infected with COVID and who had suffered trauma because this also presented a huge problem. So, Cambio. Cambio. So it was so a it great was a joy great for us to be able to work that time with the help of that hotel, to be able to welcome people there. And even myself as a director, uh, we were shorthanded. So I had to pitch in as well. And I had to help transport people 
from the school to the hotel, many of these people also had uh, were already uh, infected because of COVID. And so what they would do is test them before they could release them in order to find out if they had a case of COVID or not. So I also pitched in and I welcomed these people. I helped them. I spent time with them and I was able to observe the whole process. We also helped with organizing meals, organizing help for sick children, taking them to the hospital. We also spoke to many of the women who had been through terrible situations, terrible harm, had been raped, many men as well who had been traumatized as well. So we were able to help. Now, unfortunately, we did not receive the contract as an agency. The state selected, selected a different agency, a very huge agency, which is uh, called Catholic Charities. They're the ones who got the contract. However, I'm extremely grateful to the county. The county did bring us in, we did do the work and the county did realize how valuable we were. So that is one of the things that I wanna share with you that I'm aware of is we have to think outside the box. We have to think beyond our normal work, our normal process. I would constantly go before the board of supervisors I would constantly talk to them. I'd make appointments with them. I would say, please don't forget about us. We are ready to do this work. We are in the right uh, position to be able to do this. And of course, I was rewarded for this work because they did remember us. They did remember that we were available and they remembered the work that we did. So it's very important for me to emphasize to you that whoever is running the operation, whoever's in charge should show their face, should be present, should be uh, a presence as well. Something else, uh, you have to work with the prisons, you have to work with the detention centers. Uh, we know that it's a sad situation that our outreach teams will go to these institutions to, to try to help and they will not be welcomed there. They will not be received there. So it's important once again, that those in charge have a public face and do outreach work in order to get everybody to work with us. One of the things that has helped me a lot is the fact that I am from this area, I'm from this county. And also when I was younger, I did work within the immigration system. And I also worked with the sheriff's department at Imperial Valley. So that means that that work experience that I'd had in the past helped me understand how they work, what these institutions, uh, what their operations are and their processes. So please bear that in mind as well. We have to go find the work for us. We have to go find our, our projects. They're no longer going to come to you um, when there's a victim of trauma. They're not going to come and knock on your door all the time. Oftentimes, we're the ones who have to go because we know that we are needed. Once again, that's a key point that I really want to share with all of you. And also, I'd also like to point out how nice it is once you do receive within your community the respect and the support that you need to do your work. Because what we saw is that, yes, we were able to access these, these detention centers. Of course, during the last year, we've not been able to be there in person. We haven't been able to make appointments or have meetings. We've done everything on Zoom. And also, of course, you know, we've been dealing with COVID in all of our communities. Nevertheless, we continue to work in all of the prisons, in all of the jails, and also in the halfway houses. That is where the people who are leaving uh, institution, prison or jail, that's where they often end up as well. And so we do have meetings with them, support groups. We talk to them about different key issues, uh, how to find a job, um, issues of living with dignity. We provide support for them because so many people, as we know, very sadly are survivors of rape and of sexual assault. Another thing I would like to share with you 
is that we've also been invited to speak in the prisons, in the jails, uh, during the month for victims' rights or survivors' rights. And I wanna tell all of you, I'm very direct. I'm very a very clear speaker. And as a matter of fact, at one point, they did not want me to speak because the prosecutors was going to be a prosecutor was going to be present, and I wanted to speak about situations where people had been victimized uh, by sexual assault, by rape, and this was in Sentinella. I did speak in one of the prisons there, and I spoke directly. I was very clear. I told them what I felt as an agency, as a representative of the community of this county. And as someone who works against rape and against sexual assault and sexual harassment. Another entity I was able to access, another door that I was able to open was with the Border Patrol, Mrs. Gloria Chavez. She was the main person in charge. I don't know if you see uh, up here in one of the photographs that's where I am uh, with the uh, Central Border Patrol sector. We went there to speak to them in person to find out how we could help people, help, how we could help their inmates or their people who were being detained. In this situation, we had a young girl from Honduras. She was traveling with a group of 10 men and she was pregnant. She was about to give birth. She thought she was a month away and apparently when they were detained, uh, the, this young woman started feeling contraction, started feeling pain. And with tears in her eyes, she had to tell me that they were being kicked. They were being kicked by one of the border patrol agents. They were called pigs. And this young woman was even more fear because she was afraid of being kicked in her pregnant stomach where uh, you know her baby was about to be born and so she was about to give birth. And she was extremely frightened, but she managed to end up in Philadelphia. That's where she was transferred. And apparently everything's worked out okay for her here in the United States. She's hoping to be able to stay. We all know this is such a beautiful country. This is a great country. And of course, everybody wants to come over here, but we must be ready. We must be ready for when people arrive. So this is what I would like to focus on, on being there in person. I go to the city council meetings. I go to all of the, the, gov the government meetings for each city. We have a Calexico, we have El Centro, and they have all of their meetings there, their government meetings, different entities. And what I try to do is find out what kind of funding they would have available, how we can help them specifically. And also just for them to know we're here, we're here to help for whatever you need. I do this in person. Another really nice accomplishment that, that I've been able to achieve uh, over, over the years is to have the support of the Mexican consulate. Because obviously when things happen in the United States, they have to respond to their citizens' needs. And oftentimes United States authorities will go to the Mexican consulate and ask for help as well. And it will happen that the Mexican consulate will turn to us for help in certain situations. So that makes us feel very proud that the council and, and the staff there are able to, to turn to us for help and that they know we will be available. So I don't know if I still have enough time to talk to you about how we've been able to specifically help victims of sexual assault. I can go over some of the highlights of some of the things we've been able to do. Uh, for example, I can talk to you about a specific case, a 12-year-old girl. When she was 12, her mother died. And this happened in the border area uh, in Mexico. So there were four siblings and they were sent to different places to live. So she migrated and her aunt was the one who 
was going to bring her. So her mom's sister, it looked like everything was going to work out for her. This young girl was going to come here to live with her aunt. Unfortunately, after a few weeks, the husband of this aunt started abusing her, started getting into her bed, started touching her inappropriately. And then finally he ended up raping her. So when she was 15, she's raped by the husband of her aunt and she ends up pregnant. So we've, had to, uh, we've been working with her. We've been trying to help her. She decided to keep her baby, a beautiful boy. So this was a case that we worked on. I feel very proud to say that we were able to help her. Her life was not, did not come to, a, to an end because of this, because she was able to have hope for the future. She was able to move forward with our help. So once again, what I'm trying to say with this is we have to be available to our community for anybody who needs us and for people who don't know what kind of resources they can have available to them. If you don't make this public, people are not gonna know. You need to let people know what you're doing and you need to find funding as well. Many of our agencies, as we know, um, are offered federal funds and also state funds. I also use a lot of city funding. I'm able to find these, fund, th these funds and also I request funding from the county. We have a grant as a matter of fact that excuse me, that allows us to be able to help people who are struggling with alcoholism and with mental health issues. We all must remember that many people who have suffered abuse at work or have suffered abuse at home uh, through their, because of a family member or other situations, they often need extra help. And it's a small grant but at least it's some income for my agency. When I took charge of my agency 10 years ago, this was an agency that only had a staff of two and they were part-time staff and it had one director. So we had minimal funding, very little income. It was really barely enough to pay for our rent and to pay a salary to the director. And now today we have a staff of 20 people. And we also have a lot of, of our staff and our programs that are helping the elderly, that are helping in nursing homes. And we're an agency where we really strive to communicate, uh, to always have meetings where we can offer each other support and we can be aware of what everybody is doing. I'm also very happy to tell you that we're working with a county grant in order to be able to continue to work with people who have suffered violence, who have been abused, uh, domestic violence as well, physical abuse is $250,000. That's the contract that our agency has been able to sign on to in order to provide services. So I call on all of you to work with ICE, uh, or also to work with, I'm sorry, Volaris. It's a, it's a really nice name. And also we need to keep working with Valor US. And Valor, as we all know, represents bravery because we all need to be brave to continue to work with all of these issues. So that's also helped me a lot, cooperating with our sister agencies. I'm very proud of the work that we do in my agency, and I'm very proud to be part of the board of directors of Valor US. It really is great to see the people that are representing us in all of these positions, and I'm extremely grateful to Sandra Enriquez. She's done extremely strong work we kind of started at the same time and I've seen how she's able to, she's been able to strengthen the work that this entity use, does, which before used to be known as Calcasa, which now has a national reach. So congratulations to her on her work. 
So I really feel honored to belong to this group. And I'd like to conclude also by thanking everyone, everyone who's worked to make this, this event possible, who's worked on this conference. And I've, I'm also really happy to have learned so much with this conference. And of course, I would like to, again, congratulate everyone who's helped and also to thank all of our interpreters and everybody who's worked behind the scenes to make this possible, all of the teams. Thank you once again to all of you for giving me this opportunity to share with you, to talk to you a little bit about all of the things that God willing, I hope will help us and all of you as you move forward. If you need me for anything at all, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. It would be a pleasure for me to help you in any way I can. Thank you all very much. Oh, Margaret, we have a quick question. A uh, question is, when you work with people from other countries, the question is, have you been able to help their families who are who are living still in other countries, for example, in Mexico, let's say somebody wants to file a complaint uh, or wants to really report these situations, but they're afraid because there might be uh, some consequences for them back home. Do you have any ideas as to how you can help support the families of survivors in other countries? Yes, of course, there's help. You can always turn to the consulates and there are certain uh, government agencies in Mexico that we work with as well. If, for example, there was a Navy uh, service member, a Marine service member who was married to a woman who lived in Mexico and he would abuse her physically over there, but not in this country. Once she moves over here to the United States, she understands that that is not acceptable. So she was able to file a complaint to report this abuse. And she found out that that is not acceptable here in, in the army, in the military service. So yes, we do have a very good team that will help us in those kind of situations. Well, thank you very much. And of course, Margaret has worked very closely with us, with Valor, with our entire team. And we know she's going to continue to do incredible work with her team and with the entire region. Thank you so much, Margaret. It's, it's filled me with so much pride to hear of your work, to hear how you're such a leader in your community and all of these services that you're providing that are so badly needed. So thank you. Thank you very much. And now we would like to invite our next panelist, Pastor Benjamin. So mm, we have Pastor with us now. Welcome. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you uh, to, to the entire uh, staff. Uh, Miss Sandra, um, for this opportunity. Margaret, that's awesome. I think that we should have given you the entire session because you're an inspiration to all of us. I think that everything that you've said has been so helpful for us to, uh, for us to, to encourage us, to give us hope, and especially to emphasize that commitment that, that is needed to, to help those in need. Um, just like uh, the name of this institution, Valor, how to bring back that uh, valor, that uh, courage to disadvantaged people. My name is Pastor Benjamin Ortega. We don't have nearly the experience nor the achievements in the uh, work of uh, violence prevention and uh, sexual violence prevention as Ms. Margaret does. However, we're here because we are uh, the result of reflection from our faith-based community, reflecting on the need for us to begin identifying ourselves in a more intentional manner with those who are in need. It's been uh, about uh, two years, maybe a year uh, in a few months um, since the pandemic uh, that uh, 
came uh, or brought about uh, the um, stay at home orders. And we started to see a, a deterioration of the relationships in, in the familiar um, situations or relationships. And yes, we have been working for decades with families and the, um, the uh, dynamic and intimate relationships and uh, relationships with children, uh, families. And it's just lately that we've discovered the need for the faith community to take a step further. Ms. Margaret said something quite important. And I think that this is one of the things that we've led, what we dealt with. How do we go out there and in search of victims instead of waiting here for them to come to us? And that is how this whole work came about. My presentation today is in part to give you our um, testimony, but also to ask what is it that we can do um, how can we use our influence and the activities that we do for the community in, in, to, in order to implement it for this particular project? And I would like to begin my session asking a question that all of you in your screen can uh, share with us and respond in the chat. I would love to hear your opinion. My question is, what impact uh, or what work is your faith community, regardless of the faith you hold, what is your faith community doing in order to help solve this uh, sexual violence, uh, sexual harassment, and uh, um, domestic violence uh, uh, problematic issue? And I'd like for you to, uh, in uh, the poll question, you can let us know, please, from one to 10, how advanced or how much do you do uh, going in uh, one being the least and 10 being the most? Please tell us how your community is responding to these needs. And starting from there, I would like to share a bit about uh, experience. We can see it's quite interesting actually, uh, the, uh, the percentages in the poll, how they keep changing, they're moving uh, in, in, in our poll question. And again, uh, Wow, this will be so useful for us. It will help us take a closer look at uh, what uh, needs, um, what are the level of need, what is the level of need uh, that we have to identify those who are victims and identify those who must be in need and uh, for us to approach them. And again, our faith base community, in our particular case, the Christian faith, uh, we uh, have worked with families and we work with the community and with uh, a very large uh, group of pastors uh, throughout the state, we are carrying out this work. In fact, um, it was an, until last year that we came to find out uh, some information that, you will, that I will share with you in just a moment uh, that has a direct correlation to the poll question. We came uh, to actually see and understand the in the intentionality we needed to have um, again and forgive the redundancy but that intentionality to help people i'm originally from the Rep dominican republic i am originally i have been here for two decades and our work has always been with the families uh, my parents as pastors who for many, many years worked with uh, the community, within the community. But there was a, uh, an event that, um, that happened in my life that marked me forever. And to this day, um, I keep it in mind. And I'll share it with you very quickly. There was a problem with trash in our neighborhood. And this trash was piling up um, in a, a creek. But the creek had not only the problem of trash, but it also had that uh, when uh, people, whenever they came to dump this trash, they could also fall in there. And uh, people regularly send their children to dump the trash in this creek. So we needed to do something about this. And there were uh, different communi faith communities. The, there were different denominations, uh, different uh, ways of thought, uh, different uh, faiths. And my father called on all these uh, different fractions to come together and to carry out this work. Uh, and nothing happened. We were not able to come together until two young siblings fell into the creek and died. My question was always, why couldn't we do the work? And why didn't we have to wait till for this tragedy to happen to start the work? 
And the truth is that it happened because each one of us were so focused in defending their own point of view, their own faith, and didn't look at the larger need, the human need. And I think that what should be, uh, what should catch our attention in our faith communities is how far and how much work can we do based on what unites us rather than in what separates us, what we are in disagreement with. And again, our prime target should be people. So we need to start looking at things from that perspective. If we are going to share the final result, if you really notice, if you really pay attention, there is about 30%, uh, a 30% of people who come to the understanding that uh, their faith community uh, is um, in touch, is uh, in communication with the needs. And when I mention faith communities, I'm talking about any religious group, regardless of what it is uh, with which you identify yourself with, with, and that works on people's spirituality, but hasn't um, taken the step to identify this very real problem that's here to stay, which is the violence problem. I would like to share very briefly with you some of the things that I think is important to uh, keep in mind today, because our work has entered several uh, directions. But I'd like to ask or say, uh, point out how we uh, in the faith communities have united with the rest of the community to help those who are suffering through these uh, situations. One of the things we've learned in these last two years is how prevention is a very, very powerful tool that we can use to help those who are on the verge of becoming victims and to also uh, connect with those who have already been victimized. So if you urge us to integrate as a faith community, and that is because faith has a large influence in any community, regardless of the um, faith that you practice or you hold dear, there is an influence that is um, present with the families, with the communities. And how do the new generations, how are they responding to this uh, faith? And how also the new generations are being exposed to mistreatment, to negligence, uh, to violence. And how are we faith, uh, members of the faith community are identifying with this fight? with the fight against these issues. Um, and I think we were lost because we were looking at our faith um, in terms of defending our faith and in the intentionality of transmitting our points of view, our faith. Um, and we were forgetting about the needs of the person. We were forgetting about looking at the suffering that human beings were going through and the need they had for us to help. So again, the new generations are suffering this evil but they're not being prepared to fight, to eradicate or face this evil. But we can also, we can also see. We can also see how the rise in violence uh, is out of control. There is violence in all dimensions and in all forms. And one of the things that through our research we uh, discovered is that uh, sexual assault um, is accompanied by uh, verbal violence, um, by physical violence. Uh, these are things that come together. And these also cause other damages, other harms that need a different response. In our case with Valor, Valor was the inspiration for us to begin this work. And our our uh, participation, our work here today came about also because many churches, many different centers um, hadn't had the need to identify ourselves with this evil. 
And we hadn't been able to do that or hadn't even be, even began to look at it because we hadn't looked at the need. We were all uh, so focused on our faith. And so this, this uh, need and this, uh, this work should be carried out in the, on, for the benefit of the victims. So, so what is our calling at this particular time? For us, what was uh, the uh, call to put our faith into action? And you'll notice there's a picture here and uh, I think uh, possibly everyone knows the Good Samaritan um, parable. Um, most people uh, in, in, this, in this particular picture, we uh, don't show you the faces of uh, the participants in this picture because we don't want you to think of seeing the face of those who you need to help. Our faith must go beyond those limitations. We must be able to identify ourselves with those people who need our help, regardless of whether they share our beliefs or not. I think that that is the fine line that usually uh, inhibit us uh, from helping and identifying ourselves with this type of work that is so necessary, particularly in our Latino communities. Through our faith, we are called to, to identify and, and lend a hand to those uh, who suffer. So at the moment when we are capable of doing this, when that moment comes, I think we will have make such a difference. Then I think we're gonna have a more dynamic faith, a more dynamic experience where we can share and really make a real those things that we hold as beliefs. So what is it that we learn during this COVID season? We learned that we must come looking for people. We ourselves have to go out there and let people know that there is help, that every faith community can become definitely involved themselves in their uh, year, year to the year um, activities and the running of, of their faith community. But also we can look at how much um, impact are people suffering by this pandemic and particularly those who are suffering and what harm have they suffered through um, sexual violence. And again, during this time, that's what we're trying to develop. We have learned during this COVID, COVID season that uh, the um, staying at home, people being forced to stay at home, um, kind of uh, open the lead to some of those issues that were just latent and that were hiding under the surface for many, many people. And these were things that we hadn't realized were an issue because we hadn't been forced to spend so much time indoors together. This is the case with so many people that when confined to their homes, finally realized that these issues were there and they became victims of this violence. Um, and this is uh, really an eye opener for us to come to realize that our faith isn't just a thought, isn't just something that we can keep to ourselves, but rather we're called to help those who suffer. At the same time, one of our challenges were to identify ourselves and um, adapt our work uh, to uh, the level of those who suffer that uh, the way uh, in which people look for help or ask for help changes, that it is different uh, based on their cultural background, their immigration status. And Ms. Uh, Margaret said something really interesting. This is something that moved us throughout the year. How do we get in touch with uh, and identify ourselves with the police, with the, the Border Patrol, as a church, as a faith group, any group that you understand that is ex a, um, expressing a, uh, a spirituality point of view. How can those, those groups help to change um, this situation? So this led us to reimagine uh, the way we provided our services. We are looking at a service that is so necessary, but then we forget about other needs of these people who are uh, suffering. So the challenge was to uh, find the help find the resources to help in this work. And Valor has been instrumental for us to begin to develop a platform that can help us. We have, we have had, um, 
we have a good background in working with, you know, counseling, with helping um, intimate relationships, uh, you know, heal those relationships, parents and children's relationship. However, there was a sleeping giant that we hadn't seen. And that is this huge, enormous presence of violence that everyone suffers at home, but no one says anything. And our influence as leaders in the faith communities has to be one that provokes, that provokes these people to come and let us know. And we need to let people know that we're intentional in our work. And so at the beginning, our first steps that we took, we saw an increase in the number of people that we were able to reach. We began to work in developing plenary sessions, having Zoom sessions and meetings, connecting with other faith community leaders. We were surprised to see how many people will say, whoa, how strange. A pastor tells me that we need to unite in this kind of work. And so this is where we want to begin. Um, we need to start breaking down those barriers and unite for the sake of those who needs us, but also in the establishing of a virtual system that can help victims of violence. We are currently working in a project that will help us install in, if there aren't persons who can do the work and in, in any other com faith community to maybe help them uh, install some sort of computer device uh, where they can have internet so that they can Zoom with us uh, and not just uh, contact us through the phone and maybe um, help them uh, connect in this uh, way and then maybe provide them the help that they might be needing at the moment, providing perhaps some counseling, uh, per perhaps some consulting. And this becomes an international network. Why international? Well, because Zoom does help get um, people connected. And when we have plenary sessions, people who work within the state, they themselves call other people outside the state, people who connect with us, call their family members, uh, either out of the state, out of state or out of the country. And this is also giving us uh, the uh, ability to connect with people in other countries and so that people can see that there's a way to leave the home that there's a way to connect with someone outside of the home through these media. And we are also working with the community leaders and with faith-based communities or faith communities uh, so that we can focus on these things that unites us. As human beings, we will always have things in which we disagree, things that separate us. That's inevitable. That's our human experience. However, the question becomes, what are the things that unite us? And this has been an enormous challenge. So how do we empower our community? The com not only the community, the local community where we live, but also the faith community who listen to their spiritual leaders. We, as spiritual leaders, do have an influence. And we must ask ourselves, how we can, can we help so that people who express this faith can help us do this work? So I want to end by, by presenting the following challenge. Uh, to you. What is it that you can do? I'm not sure if the question that we asked at the beginning caught your attention, if you had ever thought about this a particular question. But again, the, the, we invite you to ask your faith leaders, your spiritual, spiritual leaders, whatever faith you practice, ask them, what can we do for sexual assault and sexual harassment, sexual violence victims? What are we doing? And how can I help? I believe that if a faith community does not take the initiative, you can be that igniter, that one who begins this initiative and perhaps even bring um, changes, changes that transform lives, the lives of people. So we're very happy to share our experience with you throughout this COVID uh, season and how this whole initiative began or came about and how this awoke in us uh, the desire to continue helping, connecting us with other leaders like Valor, like Margaret and other institutions that I believe that uh, throughout the years 
Um, and in the coming years, we hope to have that and acquire that same experience in helping all those in need. So thank you so much, Sandy. Thank you to your entire staff, your entire team for allowing us to share this space. Thank you, Cambio. Cambio. Thank you, Pastor. Well, I think we still have a little bit of time left, right? So why don't we answer some questions from everybody who's here, from our, from our audience, for Margaret, for our pastor. Let me just check here. I don't know if there are any questions right now for our pastor, for Margaret, anything you want to know about the work that they're doing. So, Margaret, here you are. Yes, I'm here. Okay, I'm looking to see if there are any questions. Yes, here's a question. What is your advice in order for us to have more knowledge or to better know the faith community when we ourselves do not belong to those faith communities. So how do you start that outreach work if you don't belong to that community? Yes, great. Well, I think there are several ways that you could do that. For example, let's say you're not part of that specific faith community, but let's say you do want to have some kind of a relationship with this community. Maybe you could talk to somebody from that community and just find out how do, how, do, how do you respond in this community to issues of violence, to issues of harassment? And you're going to find out that this community might be facing a lot of challenges if they're not taking any action to respond to these situations. So you might be the person that gives them that wake-up call where they're saying, you know, we've never really thought about how to approach this. And you might find that there are communities of faith that are interested in working more closely with you. You have people like Margaret, you have so many agencies that want to develop these relationships. So I would call that the starting point. So in these faith communities, you can also approach the leader of that community and you can find out from them, what is your approach? How do you respond to these situations? And you might find out that they have a different way of focusing on these situations. So it's always a good idea to, to challenge, you know, in a way, these leaders so that they'll leave their comfort zone and they'll be able to respond better. Oh, and we also have a comment from Claudia that what the pastor has said is key. It's important for us to focus on the needs of survivors and not on other interests, whether they're individual or from the agency. Yes, of course, we must respond from that perspective. We always tend to think about what we need, what we want, what we know. And oftentimes we overlook the need of these survivors. We have to be specific and we have to understand these elements because otherwise people are never going to know what we can offer in terms of help, what those specifics are. For example, it was mentioned before, um, what can we do to incentivize people? Margaret was talking about that. How can we get people to participate? And I think it's important to also think about cooperation, collaboration with everybody, with anybody who's available to help us with this and who really wants to help victims. Yes, uh, Pastor, and another question is, we understand that 
a lot of people in religious communities, in faith communities, are unwilling to discuss the trauma of their past, things that may have happened within those communities in terms of these kind of traumas. So maybe you could also recommend that we be more subtle in how we approach these communities, how we build relationships with them. Uh, maybe first build a relationship and then from that point onwards, go a little further in terms of offering help and discussing these things. Yes, I think you have to go step by step. As we know, every victim is in a different situation, has different needs, may vary by age, by background, by family. Sometimes they don't have anybody in this country. Their family is all in another country. Sometimes they do have family here. So I, I, I would look at it also in uh, as a general outlook to uh, when, when studying faith communities, we should understand that it would be very good to have a network because we're all different, but we all can help. We can all provide something. So that is one of the projects that I've been working on because we've met with certain religious leaders and they've said, oh, I'm not interested in getting into that or I, I'm not gonna work on that. So we've also thought about that. We've thought, how can we provide a digital help a online network so people can turn to us for help because it's people that count at the end of the day. And Sandy, you have no idea how powerful a person can become once they find somebody, once they find somebody who wants to listen to them, who wants to help them, who understands their problem, that can be life-changing. Now, also we do have limitations in terms of what we can what we can help with, or we may not have the right resources or knowledge. So with this uh, and this network, we can call another agency or another specialist and have these people available to help. So I feel that that is always the key. Ask yourself, what can I do myself? Understanding that you can never do everything for everyone, but at least be able to help with something and then turn to your network for them to provide whatever it is that you were not able to help with. Yes, that's so true. And I see that we have more questions here and some of them are just uh, direct questions to me, private questions. But I guess an important topic to discuss is how do we help people who have been hurt by faith institutions, by religious institutions, or how do we help people who've been hurt, uh, but now that was in the past and those people are no longer, who hurt them are no longer there to, to be made responsible? Well, I would say to that, that most victims are in a vulnerable situation and they need to first process the negative situation that they've been through they won't be able to move forward uh, in terms of dealing with a faith-based community until they've dealt with their own situation. There's no question that human beings are not perfect. There's no religious group, there's no entity that has never hurt a single person in terms of their faith, in terms of their spirituality, in terms of their life. Everyone has caused damage, every entity. Now, what that means is everybody's different, but it doesn't mean that you can't trust people. Some people will never fail you. Some people will always be there for you. And, and the same with some religious organizations. So at the end of the day, I think we need to separate out, separate out these concepts. A person who is recovering from this kind of trauma may not be ready yet to deal head on with the institution that caused it. So that's a very big difference. It's very important. If somebody turns to me and says, listen, this person hurt me and he's a religious leader or she's part of this faith-based community um, and, I, and I, I want to respond to that, oftentimes I will say, first of all, let me find out how to help you as a person. Let me help you first. Let's not get involved beyond that. Let's find out first, what are your needs for your future, your family, your inner peace, your emotions. And of course, it might be even impacting your health. So I think that's the first step. You need to help people to differentiate and to find the first help that is needed there, the most immediate help needed. 
because I really always want to focus on the victim, what the victim's needs are in order to be able to move on. And oftentimes these people have other people who depend on them. For example, a mom, uh, maybe a single mom who has to take care of her family. It can be someone who's fallen into a deep depression and that will cause all kinds of other problems. So I would always look at the root of the problem. When you come across somebody who is in this situation, who has this need, you also need to think about finding help for this person. Sometimes you want to help and you don't know how. And you can almost end up hurting that person a little more. The last thing a victim needs is to be reminded of everything that went wrong, all the harm that's been done. So yes, we often want to find out what is the next step to continue forward. How do we evaluate this? and never lose sight of the fact that it is the individual who is the most important thing. Yes, thank you very much. And also we, we, we also have a question for Margaret, what does Shared Helpline uh, offer exactly? What are the services that you offer specifically? And also you spoke a little bit about how you work with other advocates, other entities, other agencies, how you create that bridge within communities. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, of course. One of the things that I learned was in terms of treating your colleagues, your coworkers, treating everybody around you with respect, explaining to them that we are all the same. We are all equal on the face of this earth. We need to recognize that. And also we need to stop any kind of discrimination that cannot be allowed. So by applying these principles, you will under, better understand how to serve people who come to you looking for help. Our offices are actually in the downtown area of our city. So we do deal also with native peoples, uh, with homeless people. Uh, sometimes um, people end up homeless from different communities and they'll just wander in and they'll ask for a bottle of water. We offer them cold bottled water. Anybody who walks in through, through the door and we treat them always with tremendous respect. So we offer a lot of services, um, a lot of different services. Also, I'm offering a podcast on my Facebook. It's a live podcast. And that is where I regularly will talk about all the different services that we offer. It's about 30 minutes long. And I will discuss some of the nationwide help that we can offer, the national, the state help, and also local help. Obviously that a lot of the people we serve are women who've been abused, men who've gone through violence in their lives as well. And actually many of my coworkers also work in the school system. The schools have opened their doors to us so we can talk to, to the students there. They didn't used to allow that before. So now we can go in and talk about rape with the students, talk about how to be careful, how to, how to work in prevention. We've also gone to the detention centers. They've also allowed us to go in and to speak with the detainees. Some of them will just be there for a few days. Some of them will be there for months and they're waiting to find out, will they remain in the country or will they be deported? So the same people in charge of those agencies have told us that when we go and talk to everybody and once we leave, that everybody seems calmer after we've spoken to them because we give them, we give them resources. We talk about how to contact their families, um, the things they can do in this country, what things are like. I also belong to a lot of different county associations I'm part of the board of directors for mental health. 
I'm also on the board of the housing authority for the town that I live in. I also belong to a work training center, which helps a lot of the elderly, of our elderly community. And of course, I always focus on sexual harassment and other prevention work in terms of stopping sexual abuse. And in terms of the older community, our retiree communities, our older co-workers, they're pretty much in touch with all of the nursing homes for the elderly. We know all of the managers and they would normally allow us to be there in person. I mean, due to COVID, of course, we've not been able to go there in person, but usually we used to go in, we would have different events for them. We would even have like raffles and, and give prizes out while we talk to them a little bit about how to prevent any kind of assault, what they can do. So we can all contribute with something, right? Because if there's nothing to do, it means you're not looking hard enough. There's always going to be something that you need to be, to be getting done. Because if I see that, that someone's not really helping out very much, I'll always say, why don't you just go home? If it's a volunteer, I'll say, look, I'm not even paying you for this time. So if you, if you have nothing to do today, you may as well go home. Yes, there's always so much to do and so much to talk about. And Margaret, I would also... Uh, like to share this question with you is how can we all help the entities that are working with the detention centers that are holding these immigrants, especially the unaccompanied minors? How can we help them, especially if it's people uh, that want to help and we have centers all over the country and some are not even in California, some are not even in their area? How uh, can we help? What do you do? Well, I'm not sure I understand your question, Sandy, very clearly. So how can we all be advocate, advocates? How can we all help, even if we're not in California? How can we help these communities? So they can't go in person, right? They, they can't volunteer with you in person. Um, you're helping people who right now are staying in hotels, for example. Yes. Let's say they need different kinds of basic supplies, like even toilet paper. So if we want to advocate and, and help these communities and we're not in your area, what can we do? Oh yes, of course. Well, I think everybody has a united way near them. Um, they're happy to receive money uh, from their employees and they always get funds together. If you have a united way in your, organ, in your, in your community, uh, I talk a lot to Catholic charities as well, they donate a lot of equipment as well, like uh, the masks, the gloves, the, the PPE, all of that. Also, I didn't mention to all of you, um, I forgot about this point, is we have outreach teams who work in the field areas. They go out to the fields where the farm workers out and they bring them packet, packets with material. Uh, and they talk to the foreman there as well. And in those packets of supplies and of help, we have written material. So when they have a break, we distribute these uh, packages with, with some kind of help for them, this material, these, the, these leaflets as well. So they understand that the workers in the field suffer also a lot of abuse, sexual abuse. Sometimes the men that work there are just very obscene, very, very rude. And the foremen don't say anything. They just let it happen. So you have verbal abuse, uh, uncomfortable situations. And a lot of that is really not being dealt with. So we go there to talk to the women, especially there. We say, we're here to support you. So you don't need to be putting up with this. And as well, we also, uh, we also talk to them about what kind of an approach they can take. Um, also, I put a lot of this information on my Facebook. And one of the things uh, that I do is I'll say, for example, we need something. I'll put it on Facebook. Listen, we need uh, some extra help for somebody. 
who's disabled or who needs a little bit of a, a chair, for example, to help her uh, take a bath, for example. Those kind of things I just posted on my Facebook and instead of getting one chair, I'll get 10, you know, or we'll ask for something and some of these agencies, uh, they'll say, oh, wow, we had an overwhelming response. So we do distribute as well people for people in the border, on the, uh, at the border area, for people who are working in the fields. Um, there's a lot of different areas where we can help with basic supplies. Very important, yes. And very important always to remember, communicate directly with us and talk to us, talk to our community if you want to help. Also, let the community know that we're there, that we're present. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I received a, a request from somebody who wanted to uh, help for me to help him get a, a, fill a credit application. Well, that may be not be my expertise, but I was able to refer him to somewhere where they could help him. We're always here to help. Yes. Well, I don't know if there's any more last questions. But really, it's a huge pleasure for us to have heard from all of you and for Valor. It's with great pride that we're able to work with all of you and to offer you the, these, uh, this talk from Margaret and from Pastor Benjamin. This work is so important. We all know that we don't work alone. We can't work alone. We all need each other, whether we belong to different organizations or not, different teams. We're all working for the same thing, a free world, a world that is free of any violence. And we need to work together in different teams, in different co cooperation uh, organizations in, and in different capacities. So once again, I would like to thank both of you as well. Thank everybody who's here listening and maybe have one last question and let's see what it is for today. Sandy, yes, I would like to also share that I've also visited other centers. I went there to East LA, for example. Um, I've also seen, for example, the program with the promotoras, the women advocates. I've seen the work that everybody does in other agencies and other nonprofits. I don't know everything myself. I may have some things to share as well, and I can learn as well. The main thing is to help our community. So another piece of advice that I would give to all of you who run nonprofits, who head these agencies is don't hesitate. Reach out to other nonprofits like you, to other agencies like you, to your peers in, in other areas whether the US or in California. It's been a while since we've been able to all get together in person, of course. Do you remember, Sandy? We used to go um, to Riverside, for example. We used to go to certain cities and we would see each other in person. I really miss that. And I know it's so important for the work that we're doing. We should always keep updated on everything that everyone is doing. Thank you. Thank you for that. All the comments here are that this was a great, great uh, presentation that you did. Great work that you all do. Congratulations. And also, of course, always to remember how can we include different organizations, different faith-based communities to these events too. When we have something, say we have a, a conference, a barbecue, a get together of any kind, Let's remember to reach out, to reach out to these communities so we can achieve more goals. And as our pastor has said, it's so important also to remember not to rush the, these, these situations to go step by step so people can really heal and recover from any kind of an abusive situation. Thank you. And Sandy, yes, last week, Actually, here in my agency, we went to the mall because it's super hot here. Right now, it's 120 degrees, so it's too hot to be outside. But we did go to the mall. We paid a small amount there to do this activity, and we got together 
um, all kinds of different representatives. There were 27 from behavioral health, from churches, from all different entities. And they all set up their little stands. They all offered information and we were extremely happy. And it was so great to see each other because we're so tired of being locked up at home. We haven't had any uh, events. And it even came out in the newspaper that Sure Helpline was helping out the community. And it was wonderful to, to really understand that we can overcome any challenge if we try hard enough. Yeah. So thank you, everyone. Thanks to our ASL interpreters. Thank you to our Spanish interpreters, Jose and Ashley, and all the staff at Valor for your efforts. We hope to continue seeing you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a happy day. Thank you so much.